Hi guys, it is Dom here from WrestleSphere. I uh, had an opportunity to chat to Billy Corgan recently about his ethos uh, running the NWA, some of the talent there, uh, and a little bit of music stuff as well, uh, which you know I've got to get in. Um, so thank you so much for watching this. Thank you for, for checking this out, and uh, we'll see you again really soon. The reason why I've asked you here today is because I had a wonderful chat with both Camille and uh, Tom Latimer, and they were very complimentary about the NWA company culture and how supportive that you've been of, of them and other athletes at the NWA. And I thought that was a lovely, lovely thing uh, to hear from, from, from my side as a fan. I'm wondering, where did that empathy for your performance come from? Is that from something you learned being in the music industry, or is that something you've learned since you've been owner of a wrestling promotion and obviously your previous years working at other wrestling companies as well. Sure. Well, I think my, my being an artist uh, for so many years, I, I, I feel like I'm talent first and a, and an owner operator second. Mm, yeah. Um, many people have advised through the years not to overly take the talent position, but I think I have a different sensitivity to it because of my experiences. Um, I de I've always dealt with the business of the band, so I've always straddled the line between performer and kind of manager. Mm. So I feel very comfortable sort of working back and forth between those roles. It doesn't always work as well as I would like, but I think in the case of somebody like uh, Tom Latimer and Camille, um, they're both highly intelligent people, gifted athletes, and also underappreciated talents who, um, given the right context and a support system, I think have the capability of showing their best. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I like about the NWA is I think it provides an opportunity for certain people to come and show their best to the world without sort of a culture of, um, it's hard to explain um i know me personally i would rather know than not know yeah and i think a lot of wrestling cultures like a lot of cultures in entertainment music in particular in my case they work on a sort of a, a vague you don't really know where you stand mm -hmm. and for a talent like myself i've always found that to work against me because my natural reaction is to withdraw then try to prove something to somebody that I'm not really sure what I'm trying to prove to. And I, so I try with the NWA culture to be very transparent, say what I'm looking for from the particular talents, try to give them the assistance that they need to perform their best. And in the case of somebody like Tom and Camille, I think you see where that's been a positive. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. I talked to them about about their definitions of success, and they were talking about how they, 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 it feels really good to be a part of the NWA's development success. You know, a lot of people, a lot of eyes on the NWA now. And I wanted to ask, as a sort of response to to, to asking them, how how do you define success as a musician and as a as an owner of a of, of a wrestling company? And are they the same things? I guess I guess definitions of success change through the entertainment but how how do you define success personally uh, as a promoter and a musician and are they, are they do they intermingle that makes sense yes um i like to define sex success as everybody on the team has to win yeah so if you're with the nwa uh consistently if the nwa wins you win and if you win the nwa wins i think that comes back to all my years of being in bands in my band, there's a lot of focus of attention on myself, and I understand mm. why. But if my team, in this case, my bandmates, doesn't believe in my vision or what I'm trying to accomplish, that undermines the success not only of the team, but myself. And so I think it's very similar dynamic where it's letting talents know we win together or we lose together. And I think that creates a different spirit of camaraderie. camaraderie not everybody understands that because many people in the wrestling business for the right reasons are very mercenary. Right. And yeah. there's a way to uh, operate in that frame in business. And there are talents whose name you would know who I'm fine with the, let's call it the mercenary approach where they're taking their talents different places at different times. 
um, and there's a different approach that's necessary with those talents uh, because you must respect why they're in the open marketplace. Fair enough. Yep. Uh, so there's a balance there between, let's call it NWA culture, NWA team culture, and then working with people who kind of come and go out of the NWA, depending on what uh, is available to them. Um, it's hard to explain without going to in a really long answer. But yeah, I think as simply put, it's just the team has to win. And if you can set team goals, I think everybody takes a pride of ownership. And okay. I think, you know, going back to Tom and, and Camille and Nick all this by extension, of course, yeah. you know, we've won as a team. We've proven as a team that we can uh, do something that very few people thought we could do. Mm. Mm. I'm I'm very curious to know as well. Again, that that how how that experience because again you've been in the wrestling industry now for for a number of years. Obviously, aside from the band, I'm curious has the experience you've had working with these talents uh, not necessarily made your experience as a musician easier, as you have many many decades of experience there. But ha have you carried forward any approaches, uh, you know, around that team building thing, uh, for example, into your work in the music industry? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, I understand the intention of the question. Not yeah. necessarily. Um, I think what's great about wrestling is you learn that wrestling is very much about the moment that you're in yeah. the pay-per-view you're in the show you're doing rock and roll can have a little bit of a longer arc sometimes. And it's hard sometimes to appreciate how one show or one moment in rock and roll really matters because of the way that business works. Yeah. Wrestling teaches you that every show is important and you can never kind of look past the moment that you're in. So I think that experience has certainly come back into my musical life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I did uh, did sort of talk to you again, Camille and Tom, about the idea of legacy, the legacy of the NWA, such an important history in, in wrestling. And I wonder if you concern yourself having built such a legacy as a musician and obviously also created yourself quite the legacy you know, in wrestling now, does that does that come into your thought process? The idea of, of your legacy uh, as owner of NWA, do you think much about the legacy of the NWA under your leadership and management uh, day to day, or does it kind of not really register with you in that way? No, it does because I think we stand on the shoulder of giants, and yeah. um, the whole business does, not just the NWA. The whole business does, and I'm a person who personally believes that if you don't really respect deeply what's come before not only do you not sort of retain the lessons that were learned but you don't really get the true experience of what you actually accomplish when you accomplish something in the business that you're in i have a great respect for the people that came before me in in rock and roll and over time i've had to learn a great respect for the people that came before us in professional wrestling for example and i'll be quick about it I've spent a lot of time studying the pre-NWA terrain in professional wrestling, the 20s, 30s, and early 40s, which is just as complicated and just as incredible as the rise of the NWA in the late 40s, where you had even more craziness involved that, involving territories, who were world champions, how the press or media recognized who were world champions, it was a much more convoluted system to operate in. And you see where certain talents rose to the top and other talents are forgotten by history. I find that uh, part of the uh, wrestling business history just as fascinating as the history of the NWA and, of course, everything that came after it. Mm. Um, I think there's lessons to be learned there. But again, the other side of the coin is a wrestling fan in 2022 is usually 90 percent of the time focused on what's happening right in that particular moment mm. so it's a it's a balance point because i would love it if you could just say hey the nwa is running a show and people would come because of the historical uh place the nwa has it doesn't work like that it's who's on the card what kind of show are you putting on and what is the culture you built so um it works for me personally, but it doesn't always work publicly. Let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, three or four more questions now, then, Billy. Um, I, sure. I think I think um, it certainly seems like there's a lot on your plate now. Part of my day-to-day uh, -day work is working with young people who uh, they suffer from burnout, some mental health issues, and things like that. Now, 
uh, there are also big wrestling fans and there's going to be a, a, a wrestling uh, question centred around the UK scene in a second. But I wanted to ask you, how do you manage your NWA responsibilities? Because you, you can clearly see in other interviews and for years, you can see your passion for wrestling. You are a fan first and foremost, as I as I experience it. And I wonder how how do you manage those responsibilities when you're out on the road, when you're out on tour? Do you have any self-care tips and, and things because again i'm around a lot of people that just you know they look at people like yourself and think you've got to work all the time you've got to do all this all the time there's sure. no no chance to stop do you know what i mean yeah um from a mental health perspective i've found for myself it's important if you only work on things when you feel passionate about it yeah intellectually it doesn't make any sense because you say well what if i don't have passion for this thing that i must do and I've got to get it done. It's weird, but I found in working in entertainment for over 30 years, if I let my passion guide me, I end up working harder longer than if I say I must do something and I end up resenting my work. Yeah, It's a curious thing because it doesn't make any sense intellectually, but I found it's a very effective um, thing. I have so many things I have to do that I'm behind on. Um, just before I got on with you, I was working on something for the Smashing Pumpkins. And it's something I've kind of put off. But it's not that I lack passion for it. It's just I haven't been able to find that sort of mental time to really do it with, with heart and passion. Mm -hmm. So now that I'm doing it, now I'm fully engaged. And, and I'll probably work just as much time as I would have worked on it. Maybe even less than if I tried to do it and grind it out. Yeah, so it's finding that passion point, I guess, when it comes to you not necessarily pushing, you know, it has to be now kind of thing it comes to you. Yeah, but also I think it's important. Uh, and I've, I've talked a lot about mental health uh, yeah. in public. I think it's important that whatever you do, you, you try, you can't have a harsh inner dialogue. Um, I used to call it, and this is maybe not the best form, but I used to call it like cracking a whip, like cracking mm. a whip on a horse. Mm. I used to crack the whip on my own brain. Like I've got to do this. I've got to do this. And, I, it's just created a very negative loop in my mind of like work was not fun. Then when I didn't work, I felt worse about myself and it sort of created this, this loop of negativity as opposed to being grateful. Like, wow, I have this great opportunity. I'm excited about the thing that I love, which is in this case, music. And, and I should really only work on it when I'm really engaged. It's, it's, it's hard to get there, but when you get there, you yeah. become a much more effective, uh, uh, worker in the in the true sense of you're working at something you love. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, one more before we do the, the promo questions and, and the roundup. Um, again, I work with a lot of young people. They want to wrestle. They might have, uh, you know, they might have again some some differences, uh, some neurodiversity, uh, disability. I myself have cerebral palsy, but they they want to, you know, they want to work in wrestling. They want to. They they are inspired by people like yourself, and 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 companies here in the UK like one p you know one pw, and I guess what would be your message as someone that has built such a successful forum and, and a platform for people like Camille and Tom. What, what, what are the, what are the key messages for anybody in the UK who's building back up the British wrestling scene inspired by what you were doing with the NWA, uh, you know, who, who might want to promote their own shows. What are the key things that you would impart on any young person who, you know, is, is just trying to break into the business and trying to become a good, a good promoter, a good booker, you know, and taking inspiration from what you have been sure. able to do with the NWA. I think one of the most beautiful things about the wrestling business is it really rewards passion. If you're passionate about the business and you love the business and you're willing to work hard, there's always going to be a place for you in professional wrestling. Don't be afraid to start at the bottom. Mm. When I went to mm. years ago or whenever it was, um, I, I was on the booking committee, but I was not in charge of making those decisions. I was a producer and I was producing vignettes in the asylum, you know, with talents at 11 a.m. who are grumpy and had been out the night before. Yeah. I'm a big rock star, right? You know, they didn't hand me the cushy jobs. No. And, and one of the ways I gained respect with the boys, in quotations, is they saw that I was willing to work hard and I wasn't willing to put my status as a star before the work at hand. So once they saw that I was willing to roll up my sleeves and work with them to get them over and to get the company pointed in a, in a 
a, a place of success. That's how I gained my uh, reputation in the wrestling business, not because I was coming in as a quote unquote star, but that I was willing to be a member of the team and work very hard. So that's just a perfect example of like, by being willing to work hard, by being willing to learn, by willing to start in my case, at least in that uh, instance in the middle, as opposed to the top, I gained something that I could not have possibly gained if I just came in and I had an executive position and I was able to sort of throw my weight around. Mm. I learned so much just from producing vignettes uh, for TNA that I, I has everything to do with the success of um, the NWA culture. Mm -hmm. So you have to be willing to be that person who sets up the ring, um, trails around somebody in an executive position all day and does the little things for them, whether it's going and getting a cup of tea <laughs> or going and grabbing a talent for a vignette. Those can be very valuable experiences. So never look down on working your way up the ranks of the wrestling business. It's super valuable. Yeah. It, it does inspire another one for me. Um, in terms of what you've learned about yourself, because again, you came into TNA and you weren't, you know, you weren't heralded, you know, that's, you know, you weren't heralded as a big rock Hardly. star. Hardly. I, I think a lot of people looked at it as a sort of a strange curiosity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what have you learned about yourself, I guess, since the, from the beginning of that time, you know, booking in TNA, at the beginning of your wrestling career, shall we say, to where you are now? How have you changed and developed? What have you learned about yourself? What are the key things, would you say? Um, you know, learning how to write songs is a very particular skill set that yeah. I had to learn. Learning how to write a wrestling promo or produce a, a wrestling vignette was a skill set that I didn't have. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'd been on multi-million dollar video shoots and stuff like that, but I didn't necessarily know how to do it in wrestling. I had to learn a totally different skill set uh, in my 40s. Mm -hmm. You know, this is very uncomfortable for me as a person who's considered very successful in his own vocation. Yeah. So I was proud of myself that I was willing to take the time to learn and be criticized and learn again and be criticized again and eventually figure out my own voice in professional wrestling. And what's interesting about that is um, now when people criticize the NWA, I welcome that criticism. Uh, it doesn't hurt me like I feel like I have to defend something. I feel like cr the criticism is part of what makes professional wrestling interesting. You have so many voices, so many perspectives. There's really not one perfect way to do professional wrestling. Mm. And you learn in the ecosystem that on one level, on one hand, you have to have a voice that's particular so that you can foster a product uh, that you believe in and you're passionate about. But secondarily, you're open to receive outside feedback because that's necessary in the wrestling business to understand what's working and what's not working. Mm -hmm. Music business is slightly different in that regard because it has a different sort of a setup in terms of how it works between behind the scenes and what works in front of the public. Wrestling is very much like a, like a feedback loop. Mm -hmm. what comes into wrestling immediately almost goes right to the product and comes back out yeah. and you can see where it works sometimes to the betterment of the product and you can also see where sometimes it works to the to the detriment of the product because so sometimes as i like to say the fans end up booking the promotion which i'm not a big fan of yeah um there's been a lot of that in, in recent years and i think although it's made for a more ardent fan base that's very passionate about the the, the product that they like i think sometimes it's at the exclusion of the mainstream public who doesn't understand the idiosyncratic nature of what they're watching mm -hmm. so you have to stay open to all that yeah because on one hand you have a more intense wrestling culture than has ever existed before previously in history and the other hand you have more mainstream fans turning off professional wrestling than ever before so there's something sort of slightly oblong there but you can't say there is an energy because there's there's a tremendous amount of energy yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that that moves on to my to my sort of first plugging question. Obviously, the UK has has now had access of, of, of a fight on YouTube uh, to the NWA now for a long time. And that energy and positivity around the NWA seems to be very rampant here. And obviously, with talents coming over, you know, to, to wrestle and represent the NWA here. How do you feel about um, the, U uh, the UK's scene uh, as you understand it at the moment? And what would be your message to the UK fans who have got behind NWA through the pandemic? And because I know you struggled, you know, to, to, to keep it, you know, to keep it going. How do you feel about the UK's support of the NWA and, and those people that do tune in, fight YouTube and, you know, the fans around the world? Well, first of all, I know from my years of, of, of working in the UK, it, it's some of the most intelligent and um, 
responsive fans you can have in the world. It's always a pleasure to engage with UK fans because they really know their stuff, right? Mm. It's another level of a, a sort of awareness, for lack of a better word. Secondarily, you know, the influence of Nick Aldis oh. um, on the NWA, you know, brings a lot of, you know, and of course, by extension, Doug Williams, that that style of British wrestling is very much part of the NWA's modern culture. Mm. Um, and of course, you know, there are historical roots to the NWA being in the UK um, and other Commonwealth territories. But it's sort of interesting because, you know, that UK toughness that came out of the scene, you know, I guess, you know, from my understanding, 70s and 80s UK toughness, you know, that's got a lot to do with the way that Tom wrestles, the way that Doug wrestles, the way that Nick wrestles. So if you look at the modern NWA, there's a lot of fingerprints there from, from you know, recent uh, UK history uh, in professional wrestling. And even being friends with somebody like Drew Galloway, who I worked with in TNA, and who I'm so proud of, but has gone on to be a main event guy, um, he always was a main event guy, um, even when he wasn't in the WWE, but now he's proven it, right? He mm -hmm. is a top, top draw, mm -hmm. incredible human being. But even his love and passion for UK wrestling is infectious, and it rubbed off on me. And in many conversations that I've had with Drew over the years, I really grew to understand, you know, uh, whether it was the camps that the, that the guys learned from, you know, Fit Finley talking to Fit, uh, you know, actually at Drew's wedding, you know, learning about the camps, mm -hmm. learning how that set the stage for what was the renaissance of British wrestling mm -hmm. in the past few years. It's, 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 it's a tremendous legacy. And I think you don't always see it on the surface of, of, of people's television products, but it's definitely in the fingerprints and the DNA of what's happened. Um, and you can look no further than Drew's success at the top level. It goes back to all those years of those guys working at those camps. Mm. Mm. It, an interesting point. Uh, and I wanted to ask you as well, because again, you, you've got those good relationships with these, with these, you know, great performers on those difficult times, you know, you met, you've mentioned previously a lot in the pandemic again not bringing nwa back and and again those days where you maybe you've just done a show and you've got admin to do is it the fandom that drives you that keeps you going you know that makes you work late or is it the obviously there's a business element a huge business element but what are the experiences that you will remember you know that you remember like whether it's hanging out with drew or whether it's working with a certain talent you know hearing something that thomas said or camilla said yeah. what are the experiences that that really motivate you on those days where you are knackered, you've just done a show, you've got admin to do, uh, you know, the business side sure. is different to the fan side, of course. Uh, personally, I'm very attracted to the idea that you could take something like the NWA, which was discarded and um, considered uh, in the dustbin of history, mm. bring it back like a, like a, a dying, you know, uh, ember, Mm. you know bring love and energy back to it and and see where you can connect to that historical lineage but bring it back to have a, a, a very important voice in a very very crowded uh, professional wrestling scene in 2022 that's sort of what drives me mm. by extension then those experiences that you mentioned you know whether it's my various conversations you know mm. with somebody like drew or natty neidhart another friend of mine who mm. grew up you know in the heart dungeon part of the great heart family the deeper root of professional wrestling the family lineages like the hearts um the 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 uk you know the the the, the camps uh the, you know the nwa being a territorial system whether it was the funks you know or the uh, the gagnes uh or the crockets when you connect at the deeper level past like who owns what promotion and you get down into the real DNA of the wrestling business, that's what really inspires me yeah. because there's a sort of magic there, right? Yeah. Take it. somebody like Terry Funk worked for pretty much every promotion from the NWA to ECW to, to WWF or whatever it was <laughs> yeah. in there, you know, or WWWF. What's more important, Terry Funk or the companies? I would argue Terry Funk because mm. Terry Funk it. made Terry Funk made the magic. Flair made the magic. Brody made the magic. Harley made the magic. And now 
Drew makes the magic. Nick makes the magic. Mm. Tom makes the magic. Camille makes the magic. As a performer myself, I have to hear a lot about the business I'm in. Mm -hmm. It's important, but at the end of the day, it's the fans paying to see the performers. Yeah. Um, I've been blessed to be in a successful band on and off for over, you know, about 35 years. It's still that moment when I'm on stage singing a song. It's not the building. It's not the ring. It's that magical moment. So when you get really down deep granular into the family stories, the, the territorial stories, the changes in the business, the, the advancements for talent, uh, safer working culture, um, awareness of everything from uh, mental health to brain injury and yeah. being very cautious about uh, people's long-term health in, in a, obviously a very violent business. Yeah. These are all, this is all part of the greater story that whether we realize it or not makes us fans. Yeah. When you, when you've had the uh, honor of doing business with somebody like Ric Flair, where you're sitting in the chase ballroom and it's just you and Rick talking. Yeah. And you're asking Rick who he's wrestled in this building. And he, he names a who's who of hall of famers. Yeah. And you are talking to Ric Flair, the man, not yeah. Ric Flair, the performer. Yeah. And I'm just Billy Corgan, the guy who owns the NWA. Mm. And we're talking about that history. If you don't get goosebumps and understand the sacrifice the blood, the sweat, the tears, the passion yeah. for the business. You can't really, un you can't really appreciate what makes it so magical when it works. Absolutely, man. That's the addicting quality. Yeah. You know, we all see the highlight reel of the big bump or the big moment, the title being held in the air, but really it's the little moments. It's the, it's the 11 AM, you know, promo in the corner. Yeah. It's it's walk it's watch it's watching Ric Flair walk the aisle one more time, mm -hmm. you know. But watching him psych himself up fifteen seconds before he goes out for a promo, and yeah. you think how many times has he stood there at this curtain, yeah, oh, and man. made that magic. That's the part that keeps me going. I love it. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to explain. Yeah, to great today. talking to you. Yeah, man. Uh, quickly then, just to finish off, uh, I can obviously talk about YouTube and NWA being available there. Fight. Is there anything you feel like we've missed? Is there anything you would like to plug? Anything you feel like I might not have touched upon that you want to promote before we finish? No, just uh, we have a, a pay-per-view coming up, Hard Times, out of New Orleans. So it's our first time running in New Orleans, at least in the modern uh, NWA. Very exciting. Particularly, I think... Uh, the, the main event with uh, Tyrus, Cardona, and Trevor. I think that'll be one for the ages. Man, absolutely. Billy, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, it. my friend.